Welcome back. Texas oil giant Anadarko will begin deep sea oil drilling off the coast of New Zealand this summer as part of its exploratory program. There are two sites, one in the Taranaki Basin and one in the Canterbury Basin. But this week, the risks of deep sea oil drilling were laid bare in a report commissioned by Greenpeace. Its scientific modelling suggests a deep sea oil spill would devastate large stretches of New Zealand's coastline and have a catastrophic effect on our economy. Greenpeace also says it could take up to 76 days to stem any oil flow because clean-up equipment will need to come from Australia or Singapore. Let's take a look at some of their findings. The New Zealand government is opening up our oceans to deep sea oil drilling at depths greater than any current oil well in our waters, where extreme pressures make drilling risky and difficult. If a blowout occurred, thousands of barrels of oil could flow into the ocean every day, while overseas help would take weeks to arrive. For the first two sites targeted by Anadarko, particle dispersal models were used to analyse the consequences of a possible spill. The combination of a thousand spill scenarios based on 10 years of current and wind data allows us to predict the likely impact of a deep sea blowout. Now, the report's been dismissed as scaremongering by the government and exploration industry. One critic is Professor Rosalind Archer, head of the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Auckland. She's also the chair of Mighty River Power. I spoke with her this week and began by asking her whether a disaster like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico could happen here. Well, naturally that's a question that people are really interested in and I think we need to put Deepwater Horizon in perspective that that was a catastrophic event that released enormous volumes of oil. So the volumes of oil that were being released there are more than New Zealand's entire production from all our oil fields, all our oil wells. So it would be extremely unlikely to ever see an event of that scale in New Zealand for a start. OK, well, let's look at the challenges that you face when you're you know, drilling for oil in New Zealand. For a start, uh, the Tasman Sea, the Great South Basin, two of the roughest areas of sea probably in the world, mm -hmm. really. How does that complicate the issue? The, the, inevitably, that, that does complicate the issue. I mean, that means that health and safety just needs to be taken absolutely to the highest levels possible. But we've learned, the industry has learned a lot from Deepwater Horizon in terms of how to operate in those um, environments. Um, the drill ships that come in are supported by a whole fleet of other vessels that come with them. So I think people have this image that the, the ships out there with, with nothing but you know what Maritime New Zealand owns to support them, but they bring in a whole lot of technology and other vessels with them. And the sites they're talking about, uh, in particular in Taranaki, I mean that's around I think 200 k's offshore, which is further offshore than what we saw in the Gulf of Mexico. So how does that change or does that change it? The, the distance obviously doesn't help anything if there was a major incident, but as I was saying before, the, the drill ships are supported by other vessels that are right there with them on the spot. So if anything ever happened, the company already has vessels on site. Right, so even though it's say 200 k's out to sea, it's likely, is it in those kind of conditions, the big westerlies, the big storms that come in, it's likely that the oil would still reach the shores? Well, the, the, the concern I have around the, the predictions made by Greenpeace are that they are not realistic of New Zealand style wells, New Zealand style oils, that uh, many New Zealand wells don't flow naturally, so they actually need pumps lowered into them to pump the oil out. So they don't come you know, with oil gushing out of them like, like the image that people Right, have. so not oil is the same. No, not, not oil, oil is the same. So the oil that they're drilling here, I mean, what could come out of there? I mean, I just assume it's, it's a flowing oil. You're suggesting it might not be that consistency. Uh, yeah, so what, uh, what's typical in New Zealand is, first of all, you don't find oil at, at all. That you're more than likely, if you find something, to find natural gas. And then if you do find oil in New Zealand, you're more likely to find very, very light oils, condensate type fluids, that look almost like the gasoline that you put in your car. So not this heavy, dark, viscous substance that you see coating bird life. Still though, I imagine that would have implications if it was to go. Of course, of course. I mean, that would be completely undesirable to have released into the ocean, but the, the flow rates and the volumes that would be 
expected in New Zealand um, are much, much lower than the Gulf of Mexico and much, much lower than Greenpeace's report. So what do you make overall of the Greenpeace report? I think it's an important document for the country to have a discussion about, but I think people need to get some perspective around it, that the scenarios of the volume of the spill and the duration. So the duration, they, they simulated a scenario where we sat on our hands and did nothing for 76 days, that the well was just left uncontrolled for 76 days, which is completely unreasonable in my opinion. So it's, I think probably that's taken from the situation in the Gulf of Mexico. So what is the response like now? In the event of an emergency, what could New Zealand expect? What is our response capability? So, I mean, there's major players in New Zealand on record as saying that they could bring in um, a capping stack to seal the well um, in under 14 days as opposed to the, the 76 days. And even within that 14 day window, there are other things you would be doing in terms of dispersants, in terms of bringing in booms to really control the, the growth of that spill and to stop oil migrating to shore. People are though, it seems generally very fearful when you start drilling oil, when you have a, a nation like New Zealand um, with the coastline that we do. Mm. Are, are we right to be fearful? I, 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 I do understand the fear, but I think people need to understand probability that it is very, very improbable that we would have a large scale disaster like this and that the regulatory system has changed a great deal in the last few years to really hold everybody to account in a, a very orderly um, regulatory framework. So companies have to put in very comprehensive plans of what is their worst case scenario and what would they do about it and those plans have to be approved by regulators. Professor Rosalind Archer, Head of the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Auckland, speaking with me earlier. Let's now speak with Simon Boxer from Greenpeace New Zealand. Good morning Simon, thank Good you morning. for coming in. So from that we take it that actually this report wasn't based on the science around what would happen in a situation in a New Zealand oil spill. Yeah, I can speak directly to what Professor Arch is saying there. Our worst case scenario is 10,000 barrels per day. Um, and Based if, on what though? Because she is suggesting that the flow type of the oil and the type of oil is quite different to what you would get in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. It's based on an actual natural flow from one of the wells offshore in Taranaki. We don't and know the type of oil though, do we? Uh, I can get to that in a second, but it's absolute a real flow rate, which is recorded in New Zealand, a natural flow rate. In addition, uh, Shell Todd, who are looking at doing shallow water drilling, have also used 10,000 barrels a day as their worst case scenario in New Zealand. So I would say actually we're in, we're in a very good situation on that. In terms of the type of oil, um, we've heard people from the industry saying we're talking about the black heavy crude and we're not. It, we've actually modelled, it's very clearly in the report, a medium crude, which again is equivalent to some of the oils offshore in Taranaki. So I, I think actually scientifically um, the report is looking uh, very sound. Rosalind Archer says that, uh, for example, this type of oil, it's not that there's a, uh, a problem and there's a hole and the oil just flows out. You do actually have to pump the oil out and that in light of what's happened in the Gulf of Mexico that technology has uh, taken on massively. There are capping stacks within 14 days that you can get on and she said it's very unlikely this would occur. The key thing is I'm afraid uh, Professor Archer is wrong to draw a distinction that somehow we have to pump the oil. When you first go into a reservoir of oil there is a natural pressure, it, it does flow naturally. The figure I'm talking about as well of 10,000 barrels comes from a natural flow, no pumping needed. So the She's saying at this depth though, and this is the issue isn't it, because we do need to have the discussion and we do need to see the science. But in the middle of all of this, there seems to be an element of, if I can be so bold as to say, scaremongering. I mean, clearly Greenpeace will take a position on it. Science will take another position on it. And somewhere in the middle, we need to have the discussion. Well, we've actually gone through an interesting process uh, with the Science Media Centre, of which Professor Archer was part of. We had other scientists review it, and they were clearly showing how 10,000 barrels was um, certainly a realistic possibility and based on industry standard modelling. Um, and we've actually had this uh, Science Media Centre welcome the fact that we've started a scientific debate. The key fact here is that uh, Anadarko, who are drilling in six weeks' time, they have done this modelling, they have an emergency response plan, both of things are being 
being withheld from the New Zealand public. We're demanding from the government and Anadarko they publish it. New Zealanders have been asked to take a big risk here, and yet we don't know what the risk is. So we're, we're really trying to start a debate about facts and figures, and we do not believe that Anadarko... That's the important thing, isn't it? Facts. So, you know, um, Professor Rosend Archer talked about this new regulatory regime. I mean, when the Gulf of Mexico happened, there was this massive delay with Deep Horizon because no one actually knew who was responsible for cleaning it up, whereas now... We do know that, and there's so many other processes in place. And, and apparently, the response now, it's a bit like they say plane crashes. When a plane goes down, you learn so much more, and that's why it makes flying safer. They say the same has happened as a result of the Gulf. But there's two key issues in New Zealand. One is the deep sea that it is very difficult to get to, and one is our complete isolation from the rest of the oil infrastructure in the world. And when you actually start to look at what's going on in the regulatory conclusions of the investigation... What difference does it, all well, that Well, in the make, investigation though? in the US, they said the key failure wasn't that this was some accident out of the blue. It was because the regulators were too cosy, the government was too cosy with the oil industry. Safety cuts were made to save money. That's what led to the disaster. We believe that the government, by not revealing the information that they're withholding from New Zealand, is really putting us in the dark and that they are too cosy with an industry who are going to be uh, drilling off our coast in six weeks. If they reveal all of this information, if they come out and say, well, this is what would happen in the event of a spill, this is what we would do. Are you comfortable with that? Is well, that just what you want? That's the next step. I believe we would have very interesting debate because we've had little snippets from Anadarka saying that uh, there's a 53% of oil coming ashore and that they can stop a well in 14 days. The Shell Todd survey that has just come out uh, in the environmental impact assessment uh, that people can see now is saying 106 days for a shallow water blowout the industry itself is showing that its worst case is much longer than these assurances that we're getting from uh, the industry. And, and we just don't, we think deep sea oil is a step too far. It's, n it's not a risk we have to take. Uh, there's other uh, ways in which we grow the economy. That. Probably any government That's would argue right. that because of it's an untapped resource, possibly, and what it could, you know, it's the balance, isn't it, between the economics of it and the environment. It's the age-old argument. And it's very clear that the government has chosen fossil fuels and deep-sea drilling instead of actually going for clean technology, high technology. The third largest exporter of New Zealand is actually high technology. That's where our future lies. We want to see a clean energy future. That's going to create the jobs and multi-billion dollar opportunities for us. All right. Simon Boxer from Greenpeace, thank you. Thank you.